test match of this uh, Cornhill Test Series. It's going to be a beauty, I think, uh, to all at the moment. We've had some wonderful cricket played throughout the summer. The two captains went out to the centre this morning, though, with the match referee and with Tony Lewis. Morning, gentlemen. How have the tosses gone overall, the whole series, do you know? I don't know, I think uh, since I started using that £2 coin, it uh, <laughs> seems to have fallen in my favour more often than not. <laughs> <laughs> You've had a run, and what's the decision uh, today, Mike? We're going to bat first on this pitch, I think. Right. And uh, what about your team? So much talk about five bowlers, six bowlers? Um, we've got plenty of options. Um, we've decided to play Devon Malcolm. We feel as though he's got a history of uh, putting in good performances on this pitch. And, uh, we've got to take 20 wickets to win the match, so he's playing. And Richie, what are the changes on your side from the last test? Um, Ambrose is back in for Dan Raj and um, Carl Hooper is in for Keith Arden. And where will you bat in the batting order? Well, I'll probably bat about five or so. Yeah. Good pitch? Yeah, it looks very good. It's the best surface that I've seen um, all summer and I uh, look forward to having a very good time here. Yeah, you lost a few tosses. Well, yeah, so I've nicked, I've nicked his coin, you know, I'm not going to even back with him. Take it back <laughs> with you. <laughs> Since you started using it, I haven't, I haven't won the toss, so, you know. And confirmation of those teams, England, Atherton, Gallian, Crawley, Thorpe, Hick and Wells, then Russell, Watkinson, Cork, Fraser and Devon Malcolm in the side on this ground uh, where he likes bowling so much. West Indies, Stuart Williams and Sherwin Campbell to go in first, then Lara Hooper, Richardson, Chander Paul retains his place, Courtney Brown, Bishop Benjamin, Ambrose and Walsh, four pace bowlers there and very good ones they are. Just confirmation also of uh, the toss, England won the toss in the batting. David Shepherd and uh, Ramaswamy are the two umpires. The third umpire is John Hampshire, and uh, the pitch is uh, looking to be very good. Richie Richardson says it's good, but here's Geoffrey Boycott. Well, a super day for cricket and a great looking test pitch. If you look at this, as a batsman, you couldn't see anything better. There's not a blade of green grass anywhere, no wetness, no dampness in it. It's dry, it's straw coloured, and the great thing about these oval pitches. They have a nice, even bounce about them. So I think all in all, the batsmen will like it and the bowlers will have to work hard, but they'll always find a little bit of pace and bounce in it. But it's a cracking pitch for a test match, this deciding one. Jeffrey Boycott with his ideas on the pitch and there should be a bit of bounce there for the four pace bowlers in the West Indies side. There might be some swing there for them also. We're joining it now with the second ball of the first over. Curtly Ambrose is the bowler. The England skipper, Michael Atherton, is taking strike. That's a painful start to the morning for Mike Atherton. That cut back in from Kirtley Ambrose's second delivery of the morning. It's not often you see the England captain sink to his knees like that. Just in round about the midriff. That's low, right in front. And there must have been an inside edge off the bat onto the pad. Or maybe just outside the line. So the first test, first decision for umpire Firin Chuparam Ramaswamy. More easily known as VK. First run of the morning to Mike Latherton. The captain and England off the mark. David Shepherd, Vika Ramaswamy's partner for this match. Kenny Benjamin, the fielder at mid on. Doesn't look entirely happy. I think he hurt his shoulder a little bit when he started to throw. A slice of luck there. Atherton gets four for it, but uh, beaten by the look of it by just that little bit of extra pace. Just seems slightly late on the shot. Well, it just nipped back on him, and I don't think it bounced too much, actually. I don't think it bounced too much at all. He left a big gap, and it was a Chinese cut that he got away with. Oh, beautifully bowled. 
Several balls have come back already into the right-hander. This one just carrying on with the original line. Got him. Well taken at first slip. Courtney Brown dived right across in front of first slip there. Making it just that bit harder for Carl Hooper. But Jason Gallion is out. Well, I can't tell you how good a catch that was by Carl Hooper. You think it goes straight in, but watch the wicketkeeper, as David says. Oh, dear, to hold on to that. What a good catch. This was a typical Kirtley Ambrose delivery, just outside the off stump, just a hint of movement away from the right-hander. But Carl Hooper did ever so well. Once the keeper starts to go for a ball like that, the man at slip always has the impression of this object flying across in front of him. And it really does distract you. So uh, Carl Hooper, full credit to him. It would have been a straightforward catch without the dive in front of him. As soon as that dive came, that just added to the degree of difficulty. So England, nine for one. And John Crawley at the crease. He won't be facing that wicket coming from the final ball of Kirtley Ambrose's second over. Oh, brilliant. Looked brilliant for a moment. It looked for all the world for the moment as though Richie Richardson had dived away to his left at uh, Leg Gully. There's only one thing wrong, the ball eluded him. Three men in the slips for West Indies this morning. Carl Hooper, Stuart Williams, the opening bat, and Shivnarayan Chandrapal at third slip, playing in his second test match of the series. And John Crawley off the mark, past Richard Richardson at that uh, backward short leg position. A capacity house expected at the Oval for all these first four days of this final test match. Just the odd seat yet to be filled. Once again, Courtney Walsh an inch or so away from 300 test wickets. Well, I like that line. It makes John Crawley play. It's a little bit wide, actually, but I think he plays at that a little bit because Walsh has done him twice, had enough. Just for a moment there, Atherton was stretching. Lara made the mistake of... Uh, Made the mistake of taking his eye off the ball. Just there. Atherton was uh, suddenly just a little fearful about the pickup and uh, instant throw. Oval has been able to come up with something uh, on the outskirts. Not actually uh, inside the ground, but it all looks very nice. Tender, loving care, and that's appropriate for the drought. Just a little bit more pace here, but the movement is just as exact for Kenny Benjamin. And Mike Adderton drawn into the stroke, but just outside of thumb, just outside the edge. been some excellent bowling and some good tough batting as well not quite a matter of survival but it's along those lines haven't been uh, all that many brilliant strokes played top class bowling Crawley enjoys that shot plays it very well
Alan Wells is the man who comes in at number six, is pretending to read. That's not going to go. I will tell you uh, how difficult it's going to be to hit boundaries on this ground with um, what I might loosely term the corrugations. Lovely stroke and right off the meat of the bat. Normal run of uh, affairs. I'm sure that would have gone to the boundary. Just watch it jump here. I think the, uh, the ground staff have done the best they can, but uh, the drought has got them. Come on! ball call from uh, by David Shepherd. Up comes the 50. Good firm stroke for the half century for England. One wicket down, that of Jason Gallian. Bishop is uh, well, Ian Bishop actually was, wasn't watching where his foot was landing. Be a physical impossibility to do so. The only man who is watching it is um, umpire David Shepherd. Now we can give you a little look at um, Ian Bishop. This was the no-ball call by umpire David Shepherd. It then produced remonstrations from uh, Ian Bishop. And it was a no-ball because no part of his foot is behind the line. He was pointing out to umpire Shepherd where his foot landed. As I pointed out myself, he had actually no idea because he's looking down the pitch at the spot where he wants the ball to land. Umpire David Shepherd wasted about uh, six or seven seconds on it. Nicely steered. Didn't try to hit it too hard. Just let the ball come on. I sense a little bit of frustration for the West Indies fast bowlers. The ball's not moving very much. Just maybe slightly left the batsman, but it was nicely steered off the back foot. Mm, no great uh, amount of foot movement, but there was plenty off the bat. Caught. That's well bowled. Benjamin has been at these two batsmen all the time. He's kept the ball swinging, moving away off the seam, and that one had a bit of lift about it as well. Atherton has gone for 36. Stuart Williams was the fielder at slip. He's looked to have a very safe pair of hands, and that was neatly taken. Well, it was well bowled because he's persevered outside off stump. He's not being afraid to keep the ball up and keep it there. It's not done very much, that. It's just bounced a touch on Michael Atherton. Just a very fraction left him off the seam, but it bounced, that's the key. You only need it to move a touch if it goes at pace and bounces a bit. Graham Thorpe is the new batsman. I think Michael Afton would be a bit disappointed because I think he was just beginning to fancy himself there, that he got in. Now Ian Bishop about to start a new over. Well, Crawley's got away with that, but it was an unconvincing stroke. He got four runs for it. Yes, Ian Bishop bowling too short. That's the landmark here at the Oval, the Gus Holder. Goes right down on Sundays when Sunday lunch is being prepared. That was 
was quite extraordinary. Let me show you the replay. Just see how the ball swung after it got past the batsman. Gave Courtney Brown no chance. We've seen uh, all morning here at the Oval. Well, if there's anybody that should know how to play on this Oval pitch, it's Graham Thorpe. He plays for Surrey. He's used to this sort of pitch with a nice pace and bounce. Lovely footwork onto the front foot very quickly. Fine shot from Graham Thorpe. Alan Wells padded up there waiting for his first innings in Test Match Cricket. A man who seems to have been waiting for a long time for this chance. I dare say he'll be awake enough by the time uh, his turn comes. It's the thing about facing West Indies fast bowlers, they do tend to wake you up. Seeing that underarm throw of Kenny Benjamin's from wide long leg there, he was a little bit worried about a throw he made first thing this morning. Seemed to do something to his shoulder in the process. I'm sure after bowling so many balls in this test series, six test series is a very, very long time to be bowling and it's not finished yet. Brian Lara on his way off the field. Keith Arthurton tags his way onto the field. That's a lovely shot from Graham Thorpe. Very simple in its execution. It's a longest boundary straight on what is a very big ground here at the Oval. Nothing extravagant about the shot, just pure timing. Uh, we're now having some problems with the ball. The umpires are now going to talk again. Yes, it's a well-known tactic to try and uh, keep casting suspicion on the ball. They do lose shape at times. You find that uh, not every cricket ball, of course, is perfect or necessarily that long-lasting. That's lobbing over, that's clearing the gully. Just a little bit of good fortune for John Crawley. Takes England onto the 100 mark. 100 exactly for two wickets. There's not much shine on that ball umpire David Shepard is looking at. It looks as though the stitching has uh, disintegrated a little. You can have some pitches where the stitching will disintegrate a lot. All in readiness now, here's Ambrose. And a shot. He's looking pretty good today, Graham Thorpe. Been sitting at the uh, back of the box watching him. He's been playing straight all the way through that arc between mid on, mid off all the time. Again, if anything here, the timing is perfect. Not very much wrong with the pitch of the ball or the amount of bounce that Ambrose got, but Graham Thorpe's timing is so spot on today. That's well bowled, quicker ball. And it almost did Thorpe for pace. Might not have uh, hit leg stump, but uh, it was a good delivery. 50 stand up for Thorpe and Crawley. Good performance. It's been a, a tough, fiercely con uh, contested match so far. The first day of this uh, sixth Cornhill test. This time a full toss.
Crawley might well be hurt there. I'm not sure if he got any bat on it at all. It was uh, pitched up. So this is the ball slanted in, swinging more, and the back heel, the right heel, and that will be painful. Fine shot and a fine stop. Sherwin Campbell, the man of cover. Somewhat overpitched, didn't bounce much, and, and Sherwin Campbell showing why he's become one of the better fields men in this West in his team. Very easy way to take four runs, just let the pace of the bowler and the pace of the ball do the work. Graham Thorpe in complete control of the shot. Great shot, great shot. Tom Crawley doesn't use his feet that often to come down the pitch like that. That was a great example of how to get to the pitch of the ball and place it away through the onside for four. perfectly played the timing is absolutely spot on to small pieces of movement by the feet and bat coming down the right arc perfect timing four runs fine shot very firmly pushed straight down the ground nothing wrong with that at all and four runs takes John Crawley to 50 That's the third Test Match 50 for John Crawley. Gotcha! Got him. First ball is faced after T. Half volley in this over. Hooper has given the ball more air than he did uh, in the pre-T session. And now... There's the breakthrough. Well, the lollipop bowler has struck. Gal Hooper throwing it up. And John Crawley's made a real bad error. He played so well, 50 not out. We'll have gone in at T thinking uh, the opportunity on this very good pitch to make 100. And he spooned it just a little too early, straight at cover. Nice, neat, low catch, but you'd expect to catch those. That really is a big disappointment because that's just purely an error on the batsman. Graham Hick, the new batsman, taking John Crawley's place. Big breakthrough there for the West Indies. Just what they needed to get them going in this final session. century for Graham Thorpe and a very important one too. beautifully bowled that uh, is not just skillful bowling from the physical point of view but good brain work as well and the Jags back at Graham Hick often uh, poses him a problem you see that was marvelous shot was that I mean a very short back lift little punch shot he knows this pitch so well being a, a Surrey player Kenny Benjamin and Thorpe's taken strike. Mark that down as uh, 
very close to the shot of the day, even if it wasn't the ball of the day. Well, he's so comfortable with the faster bowlers. He's a little bit careful when Hooper was bowling. As soon as he gets the seam up, he's after them. He's thought of uh, as being vulnerable against the short pitched bowling. He gets plenty of that. Well, this is a cracking delivery. It's right over the top of middle stump. Fast, short. At least made uh, the batsman get out of the way, do something. And he gets away. Nice stroke, just a little bit more back lift. And Bishop giving Hick some wits for the first time. <clears throat> Well, it's been one of the fun spots of the summer. The sun has brought out all the funny hats. And that was straight, a good shout. And that's the sort of bustling style of Benjamin, which really worries the England batsman. Well, Hick, he was playing back, and that was... Very much closer to him than I think it, he should have been forward here. Probably missing leg stump. I think that was just about the perfect length. And he was on the back foot. Super shot. Again, the width given here on Graham Hick would quickly dispatch this type of bowling. This is bad bowling. You have to bowl consistently in one length, on one line, if you're going to be able to control the batsman. It's a joy to watch. Really good shot. The players, those punchy little drives, Graham Thorpe, just leaned on it. No flourish. And he's proven himself to be a very fine player at this level. But to be numbered amongst the greats, then a few more hundreds wouldn't go amiss. And I'm sure he's uh, well aware of the capabilities of batting on this pitch. That's past Graham Thorpe, he's edged it. That's the end of that dream. Just a tiny, thin little edge through to the keeper. And Kirtley Ambrose has the wicket of Graham Thorpe for the seventh time in test matches. And what was shaping as a very fine innings remains a good innings that's over now for 74 for Graham Thorpe. Very standard, typical right arm over delivery to the left-hander. Thorpe's left a lot of those very well through the day. And the reason he'll be so disappointed is, you know, he could have done it again. He's judged the ball particularly well through most of the innings. But this oval crowd giving a very good reception now to Alan Wells. The Sussex captain playing now in his first test match after what seems to have been a long, long wait. Often touted, now he's made it. With England 192 for four. And one ball's enough. Kirtley Ambrose strikes, two in two. What a disappointment for Alan Wells, what a disappointment for England. The short leg was posted. I think he's still not with what's happened. It's happened and 
perhaps a little bit lost right now. Ambrose bowling exactly the right line, just short of a good length, coming into the midriff. As good an attacking ball as you could find for a batsman playing his first test match and facing his first ball. I'm sure Michael Aberton will be full of sympathy for his new man. He's bided his time to get his man into the side. And so Kirtley Ambrose finds himself on a hat-trick with Jack Russell out there now. Three slips, a gully, two short legs. So, two wickets in the over for Kirtley Ambrose. A warm round of applause for his efforts. And his figures transformed. Three for 51 now. And 20 overs bowled. That's flashed past slip. That was an impossible chance. Not controlled at all, the top edge. No chance at all for Stuart Williams. It's a good strike. Nice footwork. Two hundred up for England, two oh three for five, and twenty five to Graham Hick. Catch it! Well, it's safe, the shouts have catch it. But it's finished up as four runs. Well, and so it should do too. Carl Hooper bowling off spinners with five on the offside. And only four on the leg side where the ball is spinning to is a really poor field placing. I mean, it's just money for old rope then to play the ball with the spin onto the on onside. Quite a justified shout. There's certainly no intention to play a stroke there. A bit more of that old rope Jeffrey Boycott was talking about. Empire Ramaswamy is signalling that the new ball will be taken. It won't be given to Ambrose. I think I'd have been inclined to give him one. He's loose. Looked as though he's firing on 12 cylinders. They've given it to Ian Bishop, who's fresh, and may also be firing on 12. Well, he drew Hick into the stroke there with a good away swinger. And Hick got four for it. One millisecond. Bishop would have thought uh, he had a chance there. Too short. It's just been too short most of the day as Bishop. It's not as quick as a normal over pitch. I keep saying that. See, that's just banged in. It's got width as well. They're easy balls to hit and put away very nicely. Seven more added to take the score along to 233 for five at the close of play. A good performance there from Graham Thorpe. I thought he played quite beautifully today. Timing and footwork magnificent. Crawley batted well for his 50, Atherton for his 36. And uh, Hick on 43 and Russell 9 have the opportunity on the second day to put things right for England. It's a nice even contest at the moment. Bowling figures for the West Indies. Ambrose 3 for 52. I thought he bowled really well today. 
He's come back refreshed. It was just what he needed, a bit of a break. Benjamin Bowell, one for 46, and Hooper, one for 34. Did a good job there, just uh, resting the pace bowler, 16 overs and seven maidens for him. Partnerships, well, there were three quite good ones there. 89, Crawley and Thorpe. 51, Atherton and Crawley. And Thorpe and Hick uh, put on 43. And still there, Hick and Russell, 41. That's a good effort, and that was precisely what England needed. Well, I thought uh, it was a magnificent day. It wasn't one of your slather and whack days, 300 for two at the close, but thoroughly interesting all the time, exciting for most of the day. And here's Geoffrey Boycott now with his ideas on the whole thing. Well, a lovely flat batting pitch was only really taken full advantage of by John Crawley and Graham Thorpe. Graham Thorpe, to me, always looks good, is good, and will get better for English cricket. He played splendidly today. Economy of movement and his forcing shots were exquisite. John Crawley, very pleased with him. This was his best innings in England. I thought he played the quick bowlers as well as he's ever played them. His judgment of what to play and what to leave was good, and I thought he played the bouncers superbly, watching it all the time. For West Indies, well, just when England thought they got them down, they hadn't. In came Ambrose. I thought this was his best spell of the series. At times, he's not quite looked his best. He's looked a little bit tired, a little bit of a problem with his shoulder injury. He's ball's not quite been coming out of his hand but today he seemed to revel in it seemed to enjoy himself seemed to smile a lot and he really got stuck into england and i thought he came back with those two wickets at the end of the day just gave west indies the edge on a very interesting cricket day england will be a bit disappointed to have lost five wickets on such a flat batting pitch certainly a very good day and uh, we're looking forward very much to the second day when everything might unfold in that opening session Today, magnificent. Tomorrow we'll be on air. BBC One Hill Test Match, the final one in the series. A wonderful day yesterday. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Lovely and fluctuating, as indeed has been the whole series. This is the way it began this morning. 233 for five. 36 to Atherton. 50 to Crawley, who played well under pressure. Thorpe, I thought, a great innings for 74. And Hick unbeaten on 43 with Jack Russell. 21 extras in the 233 and the bowling figures for the West Indies. I thought they were much too short all the way through. Ambrose, three for 52. Walsh, none for 37. Benjamin, one for 46. Bishop, no wicket for 53. And Hooper, one for 34. Well, yesterday there was plenty of bounce in this pitch. Here with this report now. On the second day is Geoffrey Boycott. Second morning, a bit overcast and breezy, but still very pleasant. We look at this pitch. It's still very dry. It's like a fourth or fifth day normal oval pitch. You've got one or two little cracks here, look. You'll get the odd low ball from these. One or two stud marks, the fast bowler went around the wicket. A couple of stud marks here. Because there's so little to see, you can see any stud marks at all. You can see this side, the spinner might be able to bowl into these when the West Indian left-handers are batting. But all in all, you've got to say this is a very flat, good batting pitch. And any bowler that gets wickets really does have to bend his back here. And that'll be very good news for Graham Hick and Jack Russell, who uh, were the men going out to the centre. The big surprise for me at the start was that uh, Kirtley Ambrose wasn't used. It was Courtney Walsh and uh, Ian Bishop. I thought Ambrose would have been into the attack straight away. At any rate, we join it with the first ball of the fifth over. Eight runs have been added. It is Courtney Walsh bowling, and Graham Hick is taking strike. Beautiful shot, perfectly timed, well executed. First time with Courtney Walsh was over pitch this morning, Grim Hick was immediately onto it. Just about half volley length, and the bounce was perfect. Timing, no chance, four runs. It was full meat of the bat. Now Hick's on 49. is on 50. And that's a really good innings. State of the game yesterday when he came in. That's top class. A bit of courage has gone into that after what um, yesterday was a very ordinary beginning.
Good slow ball, but neatly dealt with by Jack Russell. That's a good stroke. Two fifty up for five. I'd have thought uh, the tactics this morning are self-defeating for West Indies. We're uh, eleven overs into the second new ball, start of the second morning. Big opportunity for the West Indies bowlers to get through. Good shots. Just helped away by Jack Russell. And those gentlemen in total agreement with the umpire. That's a great shot. Beautifully placed. Courtney Walsh has strayed too often this morning. Well, if anything, Courtney Walsh here is either bowling too short or too well up, and that was very badly directed, just about middle and leg. Batsmen love those. There's no way you should be out LBW playing that, and it's more or less a free hit through mid-wicket. It's in the air and wide of Brian Lara at square leg. He's going to get four more for it. Almost deceived by the slower ball from Courtney Walsh. Although he was just a fraction early on the shot, he managed to get the ball directly between Sherwin Campbell at short leg and then Brian Lara at backward square leg. Oh, bad misfield, that's the West Indies captain in trouble. It'll only cost him two. Trevor McDonald there, a, a great fan of cricket and West Indies cricket in particular. Keen student of the game, he's read all the books, watched a lot of cricket in his time. That's, might just have taken a glove on the way down. Signalled his four runs. It didn't carry anyway to Courtney Brown. Well, there were shouts of catch it to this. Well, I think Courtney Brown would have been miraculous had he taken that. It was in front of him on the leg side. Very difficult, not counted as a chance. I'm as puzzled as most people must be that the best two bowlers for West Indies, Ambrose and Kenny Benjamin, can't get hold of the newest ball. Two bowlers who've not been successful, Walsh and uh, Bishop, and have not looked like taking wickets, have been bowling. I mean, Bishop to me is Charlie halfway. He's halfway down the pitch all the time. That's four. Very well played by Jack Russell. Nicely timed. Beautifully placed. Yes, I mean, if you were Jack Russell, who would you like to face? Kirtley Ambrose or Hooper? Nice little steady off spinner. Pick your spot on a very flat pitch. Thank you very much. Kirtley Ambrose making a belated appearance. Well, we haven't seen many get past the bat this morning. This is the right line from Kirtley Ambrose. That's actually a beautiful delivery, just enough cut to beat the defensive shot. Edged, and he's got away with it. That ball really flew high and fast. Well, it bounced a little bit here. It was wide enough to hit, but it just bounced on Graham Hick. Keeper got a glove on it, but couldn't hang on.
Beautifully played. Anything that's slightly short from Carl Hooper and also slightly wide like this is real meat and drink to Graham Hick. And the 100 partnership comes up between Graham Hick and Jack Russell. That's been a very valuable, very good partnership for England. Money for old rope is Carl Hooper. You only get yourself out. Long on here, coming into our picture. Well, that's what he thinks of Carl Hooper. And the fielders run in from the boundary to pick up the ball while Hick takes three runs. Well, it's like taking candy from kids. Carl Hooper bowling on this pitch. Three hundred up. Three hundred and one for five. Forty now to Russell and seventy-six to Hick. I know the West Indies bowlers don't like bowling around the wicket, but that's the sort of line that they're bowling, and Jack Russell does not like it when they come around the wicket like that. Curtly Ambrose is furious. Furious with himself. Waiting for the tide to turn. That was a good run, it was an easy run. The problem is with Jack Russell is that he threatens to run these short singles so often. There must be a terrible feeling that he's selling the dummy to the batsman at the other end. Is he for real? And Graham Hicks said, yes, come on. He's got some problems now. Now, totally in defense. The urgency now for these two batsmen to see it through to lunch. The urgency very much for West Indies. Just to, uh, snap out of it and pick up a wicket. looked for a moment to me as though he lost it in the background. Jack Russell he expected the ball to bounce a little bit more because that was pulled just about outside off stump to square leg and on the normal circumstances would have been straight in. As easy a catch as you could get at square leg. Not been a very good session for the West Indies. It's gone through him. It doesn't hit his bat. It's come off his, uh, well, his waistband or trousers or something like that. that. Was a hell of a delivery. This is a good ball. It just takes off a little bit. A lot of pace in this and bunks. That's a chase for Chandler Paul, just to add a bit of insult to the injury of the drop chance. Two runs made by England this morning. It would be uh, an understatement to say that's uh, beyond their wildest dreams. And that's a good performance from Graham Hick in this series against the West Indies. And got him. Well, Kenny Benjamin has done it. Graham Hick goes four short of the hundred. Just five minutes from lunch on the second day. It's the only breakthrough for West Indies this morning. Caught by Stuart Williams off Kenny Benjamin's bowling for 96. And that goes down with me as the best innings I've seen Graham Hick play. It was neatly caught by Stuart Williams. Good ball. It left him. 
Williams took it just on his right hand side very safely he's got a good pair of hands Stuart Williams look what concern the new batsman Jack Russell on 48 336 46 been a very good session for England I think they've got to change the thinking about Kenny Benjamin sometimes he he should be bowling with a new ball or at least first change he didn't get a ball till after what 25 minutes to lunch there's 50 for Jack Russell the punch of the bat denotes his satisfaction That's been a very important innings as far as England are concerned in this final test match of the series. Graham Hick, happy enough with 96. Disappointed not to have turned it into successive hundreds. Exciting game, test cricket. I think that just carried Courtney Brown again diving away in front of the slips. Well, big disappointment for Kenny Benjamin. I don't think it was so easy for the uh, keeper, but uh, you've got to call it a chance. Well, it went to hand. It would be very harsh to put it down as a chance. Erwin Campbell at short leg has some great reflexes. This was not middled. It was what you might call a, a pretty firm poke. Ian Bishop making his way up the steps. Which means that Keith Arthurton is back on the field. Regular substitute. That's a good shot. Found the gap brilliantly. The time that they pitch on Jack Russell's leg stump like this, it's gone for four. Oh, that's close again to showing Campbell. This time hit more firmly than the previous chance in Kenny Benjamin's previous over. Campbell's still pretty deep at short leg. Brings up the England 350 as they move on to 351. There's some mental problems out there. Richie Richardson, the West Indian captain. Not many will agree with his approach to the day's play with the early bowl for Carl Hooper. But his fast bowlers certainly have given him every possible effort. Shot. Wonderful shot. I think the game was slightly put away from the West Indies by some of the worst captains we have seen for a long time. Ambrose did not start this morning and started only after but an hour of really inept bowling by both Bishop and Courtney Walsh. Well, he kept it down quite brilliantly because he manufactures his own stroke. Now, don't go into the back garden and practice that because you probably scoop it through a neighbor's greenhouse. I don't see, think you'll see this shot in anybody's coaching manual, but effective. When you place very close fielders, there are very big gaps behind them. That's Mickey Stewart. Interesting spectator. That's short and really punished.
cracking shot by Jack Russell. Very unusual piece of bowling from Kenny Benjamin, who really has been the bowler who's kept the ball up to the bat. Witnesses 10 wickets at Trent Bridge. Oh, a little nick, and that's it, and up go the arms of Courtney Walsh. His 300th test wicket has come at last. It seemed an endless wait for him. 300 wickets, an absolute totem pole of an achievement. Applause now, thickening right around the ground. And Mike Watkinson will be in the record books, at least Courtney Walsh's record books, and this is how it happened. Now, Courtney Walsh is going to remember this for a long time. Just the top edge of the bat there, and Courtney Brown did not have any mistakes. So two Courtney's involved, but I think the one that's most important is Courtney Walsh. 300 test wickets at 24.82. Tremendous effort. Certainly achieved something as only two West Indians have done so far beside him. That's Lance Gibbs and Malcolm Marshall. Dominic Cork is the new batsman. And we have a change in bowling. Kenny Benjamin takes a rest. Ian Bishop returns. With just one slip in this time. And immediately Bishop decides to go around the wicket. Sweet shot. Lovely shift of the weight onto the front foot. Classic. Ian Bishops considers uh, what might have been had there been a third slip. 11 runs off the over. 383 for seven. Unusual. But he got away with it and it fairly raced away down to the third man down. And up comes the 400. That's got away nicely. Now there was a brush on the way through as Dominic Cork went for the run. Kirtley Ambrose certainly wasn't moving out of the way. It's worth a comment and worth a stare. Yes, yeah, Kirtley wasn't best pleased because technically he's not supposed to get out of the way. It's the batsman that's got to run round the bowler. Dominic Cork is a confident sort of player running with his head down, just runs into him. Well, I might just argue with that, Geoffrey. Uh, Dominic, to me, there looked as though he'd made to try and get round Kirtley, who actually handed him off. Not quite as powerful as Jonah Lomu, but uh, there was uh, a little bit of aggro in there. Oh, he's bowled him. Kirtley Ambrose strikes. And Jack Russell has the top of his off stump clipped by the West Indies leading bowler. It's the end of a very fine innings indeed by the England wicketkeeper. 221 deliveries it lasted, 292 minutes. Finally succumbing to a good delivery from Kirtley Ambrose. Right on the stroke of two. Well, I know it's a pretty good ball, but I just wonder if there's a little bit of tiredness in this. It just slants across him. You see the bit of movement. But he's been playing those pretty well all day. He's been at the wicket now four hours today, about an hour yesterday. Pitches about leg and middle somewhere, leg stump, hits the top of off stump, so that's a good ball. Dominic Cork's night in, not out. And he's been joined now by Angus Fraser. I quite got onto that. Yeah. 
out of it actually uh, met the bat. Looked more as though it might have uh, got him on the fingers. First time I've seen Cork try to hook here. Got onto him, I think, quicker than he expected. Hit the top of the bat and dropped well short of the man at fine leg, but he seems to have a problem with his leg. He's running, he seemed to be limping just now. Evan Malcolm is ready to test um, the four man pace attack of the West Indies. I don't think that's uh, what England had in mind with Dominic Cork. Maybe calling for a run up. Yeah. Well, you never know with body language these days, do you? It's. Uh, It looks as though he wants a throat spray, but he's limping. There's got to be a connection somewhere, but I dread to think what it is. Well, I reckon uh, Dominic Cork did the damage when he played that hook shot off Ian Bishop. Played it there, came off his hand. The effort of swinging around to play that hook shot, it looks as though he might have damaged a groin muscle. Well, he's waiting on uh, a runner. Well, I quite like that. I think Wells has got a bit of character. As I thought yesterday when he took off his helmet and walked back bareheaded, didn't uh, hide behind the anonymity of a, a grill and a helmet yesterday after he'd got a first baller. And now he's taken the chance to get out there again and act as runner. The only scenario uh, we wouldn't really want to see is um, for him to be run out. It's quick work, but uh, not quite quick enough to get Fraser. Quite sure how that missed. Just snuck through the gap. It was a perfect Yorker. I suppose nigh on perfect. Had it been perfect, it would have hit the stumps, but snuck through there, just missing leg stump. Oh, that's bowled him. That's perfectly directed. Had a practice run early in the over. That's nothing if not a problem for Dominic Cork this time. Finally bowled. Cork goes for 33. So Kirtley Ambrose has his reward for plenty of effort. Five wickets in the innings. This has been a superb spell of fast bowling. Not a great amount of luck today, but he stuck with it. Now it's for the second over. And there's the state of England's first innings. It's a healthy total, 443. One more wicket still to fall. Place your bets now. Devon Malcolm facing Kirtley Ambrose. Shots. That's the way to play, Dev. This shot here has brought up the biggest roar of the day. More runs here, no ball call to start with. Okay. 
Bradley Ambrose doing the right thing, still trying to fire in these Yorkers. A contented captain. Very happy to watch from the comfort of the dressing rooms here. Someone else looks vaguely familiar too and far more active. Fraser out of the firing line. England on to 450. Well, Kenny Benjamin going round the wicket. Another short leg comes up. That doesn't bode well. Well, I'll take that. <laughs> Devon Malcolm, immediately having played that shot, looked at the bat. Almost as though he wasn't sure whether it was he or the bat that was responsible for the shot. Actually, I well, think actually, that's why. I think there's a piece of the bat that has been <laughs> taken out with that shot. It must have been hit with tremendous power. That skied over cover and caught. So, a good catch by Brian Lara to wrap up this England innings. Who knows if that little bit of bat had still been left on. Devon Malcolm might just have cleared Brian Lara there, but uh, an entertaining finish to this England innings. That was a great performance from England, 233 for five at the start of play, and then 454 all out. That's the best innings I've ever seen Graham Hick play, 96 and Jack Russell did a great job also for his 91. And the bottom of the order, I thought, did wonderfully well. 13, 33, 10 and 10 to take it up with the extras to 454. And just to underline what a, a terrific job was done with those later order batsmen, as well as the ones uh, at the start and in the middle. The partnerships there up the top, 51, 89, 43. But then Hick and Russell, which ended today 144. And from there down to the end, 36, 47, 24 and 11. Now it's a very good looking list of partnerships and uh, it's reflected in the West Indian bowling figures. Kirtley Ambrose, I thought he was outstanding. 42 overs, 10 maidens, 5 for 96. He bowled with intelligence as well as skill. Not always the case with the other bowlers. Courtney Walsh picked up his 300th test match wicket, 32 overs, 6 maidens and 1 for 84. Kenny Benjamin moved the ball in the air, but uh, by and large, apart from Ambrose, I thought they were far too short. We join the West Indies innings now. It's the second ball of the first over. Devon Malcolm is the bowler. Stuart Williams has taken strike, and there are no runs on the board. That's the first boundary of the innings. Second ball of the innings, first four of the innings. Stuart Williams, not one to hang around. Well, he's also a batsman we've seen in the test match that he played. He likes the ball short of length. flown through slip. Well, the runs are flying off the edge of this bat. Well, partly the middle, partly the edge. That well, I thought that was a pretty decent length of ball, David. I thought uh, that was a rush shot. Cracking shot. Well, I'm not certain about the footwork, but the backwork was scintillating. Yes, he won't play a better shot than this. But look at the feet, they've not moved. If you get a pitch where it moves about a bit, he's going to have a few problems. And again, no negligible footwork, plenty of backwork, and really it looks as though Stuart Williams has just wandered into the nets. Another good shot. Watkinson is chasing. Oh. 
Russell won't make it. Norwell will Fraser coming in. Well thought out, well bowled. A little bit of luck has gone for Sherwin Campbell. And this is the kind of luck that England's had, so it goes both ways. Given him. Williams goes. No doubt there's a sound, but uh, I don't know that Williams is totally enamoured of uh, the decision. But his initial action suggests that he didn't think that he was out. He did seem to drop the handle before the ball actually passed him. And surely that did not hit his glove and surely didn't hit the bat. This position, it does suggest to me that it did not hit anywhere that should have been given out. They don't mind working their fast bowlers hard these days, uh, Colin. They've shoved Kenny Benjamin in to come out as night watchman. Just saying that that's one bouncer for the over. The crowd roared as soon as he put up the one finger. Might be something the ICC need to look at. Otherwise, there'll be a few batsmen out there having mild coronaries. Certainly could pose some problems for batsmen if uh, umpires keep on doing that. Stuart Williams, uh, the man there who might have been just a shade unlucky, caught by Russell off Malcolm for 30. Campbell unbeaten on 17. Kenny Benjamin, the night watchman, on two. There's one extra, and it's 50 for one. Now, the bowling figures. Malcolm, seven overs, two maidens, one for 31. Fraser, five overs, three maidens, no wicket for 10. And Watkinson, one over for eight. Two short balls there, and he does have an injured hand. That's the way the game is after the second evening of uh, the sixth Cornhill Test match. England, 454. West Indies, 50 for one. And West Indies, 400 and four runs behind. And here with his ideas on uh, how the day went and what might happen tomorrow is Geoffrey Boycott. It was England's day in terms of ability and good fortune. The good fortune came early in the morning when Richie Richardson inexplicably did not bowl Ambrose for 45 minutes with the new ball and he didn't bowl the other best bowler of yesterday which was Kenny Benjamin for over 100 minutes. I couldn't understand it. I thought it was appalling captaincy. It gave England the opportunity to get set against the least effective bowlers, Walsh and Bishop, and then the little lollipop slow bowling of Hooper. They took full advantage of it. Hick played splendidly. He looks very, very comfortable to me at number five. I hope England don't experiment and put him earlier up the order. Keep him at number five. He looks really good. Jack Russell, well, he's a priceless commodity. Gritty, great character, fights. He doesn't have a lot of shots, but I like him. He really is a Jack Russell terrier. He's a good one. And then right at the end of the day, West Indies had the misfortune to have a terrible mistake against them. I'm glad it was a neutral umpire from India and not an Englishman, because that decision left West Indies, I'm, I'm sure, fuming in the dressing room. Tomorrow, England have to bowl well. They have to strike early, get amongst the West Indians and try and make them follow on. Three more days to go in this Cornhill match and we'll be on air tomorrow. The highlights of the third day's play of this test match at the Oval. It's the sixth Cornhill game of the series. We've had a wonderful summer so far. It's been nice fluctuating cricket all the way through. And that was the pattern of the first two days of this game here at the Oval. This is the way they started on the third morning. 50 for one. Williams out for 30. Malcolm claiming the wicket. And Campbell 17. Benjamin 2 came in as night watchman. And uh, he did very well just to take them through to the close of play. The bowling figures for England, just uh, the three men used. Malcolm, the wicket of Williams for 31 in seven overs. Fraser, five overs, three maidens, and no wicket for 10. And Watkinson bowled two loose deliveries to Campbell. He dispatched them very, very nicely to the offside boundary, and uh, he bowled just the one over. State of the game at the start uh, of play on the third morning. West Indies, 404 runs behind. And here's Geoffrey Boycott now with his thoughts on the pitch. Third morning and the pitch has hardly changed. If we look at it, what you can see are a few cracks here, but it's a very full spinner's length. 
It'll just turn a touch off that if Watkinson bowls into it with his off spinners. But other than that, there's hardly a mark on the pitch. If we walk down here, this is the seamer's length, we'll find all the red marks look. But at the side of the red marks, nothing. You can hardly see where the pitch has been touched. I think he'd play on this pitch for another week. And I don't think anything much would happen. Look at him all over the place. It's flat, it's dry, it's getting a little bit slower. And all in all, it's just a very good batting pitch. So England will have to bowl well, hold the catchers, and they'll have to work jolly hard to make West Indies follow on. Thank you, Geoffrey. I think I detect there that uh, Geoffrey wouldn't mind batting on that track himself. At any rate, we're going to join with the first ball of this third day. Fraser is the bowler, and Sherwin Campbell is taking strike. And inducing an error straight away. Wide of the off stump. And not a good shot to start the morning with from Sherwin Campbell. Nowhere near the ball with his feet, nowhere near the ball with his bat. That's a better shot. Straight down the ground. And an early test for Dominic Corks. Uh, injured draw in. That might not be quite the way to go about it. You can see him still uh, looking very ginger there. Certainly a loosener for him, but if you have a groin problem, whatever your natural enthusiasm, it's best at the start of a day like this to be probably a little bit more careful. Oh, chance goes begging. Frustration for Devon Malcolm. That was a genuine edge from his first ball of the day. And neither Graham Thorpe nor Graham Hick appear to pick it up at all. Bisected them pretty nicely. It was after you, old boy, I'm afraid. And sorry, no, that's yours. Probably too good for Kenny Benjamin. That was a perfect delivery. Are you bet, sir? J Major. That's a great shot. A chase for Alan Wells that's going to turn out to be fruitless. Bonjour. Very well bowled. It wasn't all that short, but it got up just enough to uh, bring the batsman into the stroke. Just cramped him a little for room as well. I think I might have been tempted to get to cork into the action pretty quickly. Ah, he is just about to come on. But uh, I was thinking basically I might even have uh, opened with him. You'd want him to get into the action because he just seems to be a golden arm at the moment. Something happened. Something good happened for England. Well, the first one will be a possible problem. Could be short, or it could be up, making him play. Always trouble when you. This final test match, the Cornhill Test at the Oval, test uh, series containing six such games, and we've had some wonderful play, not least yesterday with that 179 from Lara. That shows up on the scorecard of the West Indies side as they start the fourth day, 424 for four, 179 for Lara. Court Fraser, bowled Malcolm. Richardson, 87, not out, and a good innings, too, from uh, Sherwin Campbell. Kenny Benjamin, the night watchman, did a good job. Bowling figures, well, they reflected uh, in the batting as well. A lot of runs made yesterday at a very, very brisk rate. Malcolm, 2 for 95. He dropped Hooper off his own bowling. They'll regret that, I reckon. And uh, wicket for Fraser and one for Cork. And the state of the game, uh, England, 454. West Indies, 424 for four and the West Indies 30 runs behind. Well, the pitch has been very good so far. Here's Geoffrey Boycott's report on today. Fourth morning at the Oval. Just have a look first on this very good pitch where Dominic Cork has been sticking his big feet and the umpires have been getting a little bit cross. This is about middle stump to middle stump. He's not supposed to have stud marks here. And that's why he's been warned twice by the neutral Indian umpire. 
There are the stud marks, clear as a bell. That's about middle stump, middle to middle. And he's on the danger area. Got to keep off 12 inches from that. If we move down the pitch, it's not really changed at all. It's just getting drier and drier, more straw coloured. And as that happens in this heat and sun and the little bit of wind, you might get an odd little mark like that. It's so dry that the top's gone. But that's about the only place I can find on this pitch that's got any sort of damage. We move down a bit further on the length. You see here, still flat, dry, red ball marks have made no impression on it. And this is still a very good flat batting pitch, as any of the bowlers on either side will tell you. Well, I know one or two over the wrist spinners who uh, wouldn't mind having a go there, but that's another story. We're going to join play now on this fourth day with the second ball of the first over. Angus Fraser is the bowler. Carl Hooper is taking strike. Sweetly timed. That's a good start for Richie Richardson. Loose delivery. Banged away down to fine leg. Yes, I'm not sure he got this uh, fully where he wanted it, but it doesn't matter really. He gets some bat on it and it goes quickly down that pavilion end. Brilliant catch. Richie Richardson gone for 93 to one of the most brilliant catches you'll see. Came right off the meat of the bat. And the fielder, Graham Hick, had to go to his left. And he has taken a blinder. Well, it really was a ball that wanted hitting. It's halfway down the pitch. He's right in the slot for Richie Richardson, his famous back foot slash. But he's got to miss the man, especially if he's a brilliant catcher like Graham Hick. Bit of disappointment there for Richie Richardson. You can tell from uh, his body language, he couldn't believe that uh, catch came off the middle of the bat. That brings in the new batsman, Shivnareen Chanderpaul. It's a very good start for both uh, Cork and Atherton. Oh, that's worth asking. It was very well bowled. He's got himself just outside off stump, but the big question is, was he playing a stroke? Ooh. Well, his movement after the ball struck him, that was beautifully bowled by Dominic Cork. Shot. He's giving him a nice juicy ball on his legs, but uh, the batsman who's just come in, he's tucked it away very, very comfortably. That says a lot about the pitch, just eased onto the front foot. But what I do admire about Chanderpaul is the way he actually does throw his weight right over the ball. He gets the movement right into the line. Well, that's an easy four runs from no great shot. Little chop. No third man down there. Do you remember how this game started when he saw the ball fly off the edge between two stationary slips? Take a look at this. 
Well, he was taking his bat away. He was going to play it, and then he sort of half wasn't going to play it, but it was too late. It had nicked and gone, and both slips were asleep. Beautifully bowled. Well, the idea of fielding first and second slip is that you actually are certain that there is not the gap between Thorpe standing back, Graham Thorpe at second slip closer, and all the angles should be covered there. Russell, Thorpe, and Hick. Well, that's another sign of a loss of concentration. Now, all this is not much fun for the fast bowler. That finds the gap. <laughs> Terrific effort. But where's the ball gone now? I've been joined by Colin Croft, who I hope can add up. How many did they run then? Oh, morning, Tony. I think that's five. Good effort. Saving one, giving away two. This is the throw. That suddenly set off. <laughs> In a very strange direction. In the meantime, we have changes here since the umpire is now signaling four. So we subtract one from five. Well, actually, I think the ball did not hit the rope, but watch Mike Addington's feet when he's picking the ball up. He is over the, f the rope, which suggests it would be four runs. And that's a brilliant catch. He dropped it. It looked as, as he brought his hands up it looked as if it went in this was going down but it, w it did carry difficult catch but it did carry on the full three man just about second slip hard catch but catchable oh. well that hits Carl Hooper on the head He says he's all right straight away, so the helmet's done its job. But... Well, this is as good a bounce as you could get. Short, fast, and straight. It hit, I think, just on the middle of that piece of tape that Carl Hooper has protecting the emblem. Dismissed with contempt. Carl Hooper in form has so much time to play his shots. And on a pitch like this, that sort of length from Angus Fraser is going to go a long way. It's a partnership between Shiv Narayan Chandra Paul and Carl Hooper. Just taking 81 balls. And uh, Mike Watkinson is about to come into the attack at the pavilion end. Instant response from Carl Hooper. Dragged it from well wide of off stump. Carl Hooper, a murderous player of spinners. And not waiting to take the attack to Mike Watkinson. Beautifully played. Angus Fraser over pitching, Carl Hooper taking full advantage, and the West Indies moving on past the 500 mark. Well, they're asking uh, whether or not he got back. Jack Russell doesn't think he did. 
It was very wide. Russell had a long way to go after he took it. Chanderpaul was very, very quick to get uh, back towards the batting crease. Safe as bungalows. I think it's a dangerous move for the left-hander Chanderpaul to be dancing down the pitch. It's all right for the right-handers, but to Watkinson's bowling around the wicket into that bowl is rough. And the ball could jump and turn, as we saw in the previous delivery. Oh, Fine stroke. Plays that sweep very well. Yesterday we saw Lara placing the ball with his sweep. When they moved the field to fine, he swept it wider. And uh, Chanderpaul also plays the stroke very well. Fifty for Carl Hooper. <clears throat> One hundred and nine balls it's taken him. Not without the odd slice of luck. That's a fine shot. Mike Watkinson dropping too short. And uh, interestingly enough, without any cover beyond that inner ring, once the ball was through, it was always going to go for four. That's a fine shot. That's given no one any chance of cutting it off. Dramatic fashion to bring up the 100 partnership between Carl Hooper and Shivnarayan Chanderpaul. <laughs> and 50 for Shivnarayan Chanderpaul now, following quickly in the footsteps of Carl Hooper. Very steady, very competent batting by this young man from Guyana. The applause is for the throw, but it's all very composed batting now 550 comes up five wickets down I think he was absolutely certain about that full toss hammered away through mid wicket something of a cross bat here outside off stump but hitting it on full and short of it, safe enough of a mid wicket for four. A big shout for LBW. Wow, he says. I don't think the umpire would have given this card. Who was actually playing a shot? It did hit the pad and then the bat. Shot was being played at. Backing shot. Very physical response from Carl Hooper. What a magnificent straight six. There's so much elegance about it, and yet it was quite brutal. Well, there was a cracking 
shot. He plays that well with a quick turn the wrists. Really middle that. Well, the runs are flowing everywhere now. Although Dominic Cork is bowling with a great deal of zest and uh, enthusiasm. Really, it's uh, one leg side, one offside, one short. Most delicate shot. Using the pace of the ball. Runs everywhere, just two fielders in, saving the one. And the scoreboard tells its own story. 600 up, Carl Hooper moves on to 95. That's a beautiful strike. Just great footwork. Oh. A chance of a sweep. Century for Carl Hooper. His fifth in Test match cricket. Made one against India in his second test. Then he's made two against Pakistan and one previously against England at Lords. to cope with a slightly awkward bouncing ball nonetheless one would have had to back him to do it certain parts of this outfield looking very rough but uh, a pretty basic error oh, he's lofted that many many miles in the air that's come a long way back. That might have attracted the interest of NASA on the way down, if not on the way up. Safely re-entered the Oval's atmosphere, this one, but it went a long way up. That's out, straight into the midriff. Easily caught by Jason Gallion. And Shivnarayan Chanderpaul's dream of a Test Match 100 yet to come true. Out for 80, it's been a very fine innings. Yet another West Indies batsman taking advantage of these very fine batting conditions, but just leaning a little bit back on that. Hit it on the up. Hit it pretty cleanly, nonetheless. And unfortunately for Chandra Paul, straight at Jason Gallion at extra cover. New man, Courtney Brown. Hooper is still there, not out, 116. And Courtney Brown's immediate task is to try and keep this momentum going. There's another great shot, straight down the ground. Hooper now treating Devon Malcolm as a medium pacer. 
Well, Carl Hooper started that shot with 116. That was a half volley, just about middle stump. It's highly optimistic considering uh, our current drought conditions. Straight up in the air, but safe. Unlucky, Dev. Did well to reach that. I think Kyle Hooper here is trying to make sure that the lead is 200 when T is taken. Has he got him? Yes, Jet Russell's clutching the ball. Carl Hooper walking, I assume. Although Carl Hooper has now uh, stopped himself in his tracks. Umpire Ramaswamy hasn't given him out as such, so uh, if I were Carl Hooper, I'd just stand there, check on the decision. In fact, uh, out of shot, umpire David Shepherd has confirmed the scoreboard but indeed, Carl Hooper's innings is over. Caught by Jack Russell off the bowling of Devon Malcolm for 127. That's 126 runs later after Devon Malcolm had put down a very simple court and bowl chance last night. And it's been wonderful entertainment. Carl Hooper at his best. He's played some glorious shots. Some wonderful striking of a cricket ball. Here's another look from behind the bowler's arm. Clear edge and a very good catch from Jack Russell. Just carrying through to him. No, there should have been no real doubt, doubt about that. very severely. Well, I did say I thought all the tailenders will have a go at anything short. They have nothing to lose. They're after quick runs. They can play and not worry about getting out. And that's a fine blow. That's a good shot. Every so often, Dominic Cork will drift on to the uh, batsman's pads, and uh, these West Indian players are very, very strong there. That's a good one. That's what I would like to test uh, the bowlers out, the same way as the bowlers like to run their own little examination rule. That's a good shot. Certainly bat this fellow, Courtney Brown. Would have been gone for all money had it hit. Well, Ian Bishop's a big fella. Uh, once you start him running, the call was on, you see, once you start him running, he has to turn round. It's not so easy, it's like a Sherman tank turning. That's a big shout there. And this could be a run out, and it's... an easy run out. Well, it'll be very interesting to know what was going through Ian Bishop's mind there. Now then, Geoffrey, how did you read that? 
Well, he nearly got run out the previous over, and he just whacks at this, as they have been doing in the last half an hour. They've been whacking at everything. He sees it run away, and he just sets off. But I don't, forgot about his partner, and his partner didn't really bother to run. I think there was a run there if they'd have both gone straight away. Kirtley Ambrose. It's been a, an exhausting day out there for England, and there's the evidence. Touch of the Sunday school outing about that. And actually beats their highest against England at the Oval West Indies. They put up six, eight, seven, four, eight back in 1976. Three more runs added to take the West Indies declaration score along to 692 for eight. That was a great performance. They didn't just grind their way there. They thrashed England yesterday, kept it up today. The run rate was magnificent and uh, spectators and television viewers were treated to a feast of batting, some glorious strokes. Lowry yesterday, 179. Today, Richardson out for 93 fairly quickly. Then that splendid partnership between Hooper and Chanderpaul. Hooper 127, Chanderpaul 80 needs to be kept in perspective because uh, England weren't setting attacking fields. They were also looking for the declaration, but uh, it was a very, very good piece of batting from those two. And then Courtney Brown, I have a bit of time for Courtney Brown as a cricketer, and uh, I thought he batted well out there today for 27, and Bishop was run out for 10. 32 extras, and the partnerships, magnificent. Yesterday, Lara Richardson, and uh, today, Hooper Chanderpaul, 196, and then two little partnerships at the end, 22 and 33. Well, you wouldn't expect the bowling figures uh, to be anything to write home about, nor are they. Malcolm, three wickets, bowled well at times and um, in a bit of disarray at others. Fraser, one for 155, and Cork, three for 145, and the other three, Watkinson, Galleon, and Hick, failed to take a wicket. That's the way it looked at the end of the West Indies innings. England, 238 runs behind. And we join the England innings now in the first over. It's the third ball. Courtney Walsh is the bowler. Jason Gallian taking strike. Great cheer goes up. And the young man is off the mark. First hurdle. Well, there was a half shout here of catch. Bunks and landed well wide of the man of third slip. Oh, an appeal. It came off something, but this time off his chest. He's been really vulnerable against the, the rising ball as Jason Gallion. Well, the position of the bat here is interesting. He's dropped his shoulder, his hands, and the ball just clips his shoulder, I think. Four runs. Come to expect that sort of stroke from Michael Atherton. Right on top of the bounce. A straight bat, but the ball angled out square on the offside. And the skipper's off the mark. It'll be a long chase. I doubt if they'll make it. And suddenly the ball slows up, but uh, not that slow. Just a firm push to mid on. There was no one fielding there. <clears throat> Two fours in succession for Mike Atherton. That's for balls. Nice up in the slot. Well, in the first innings, Courtney Watch it have a loud shout against Jason Gallion also. 
perhaps might have been missing leg stump since the middle and off stump were very visible when that appeal was made. That's going to race away for four. Yes, Kirtley Ambrose's direction has not been good in these few of us so far. Nicely struck. Ian Bishop giving chase. And he can call that off now. Both these batsmen have found that deep wicket boundary, that wide long on boundary from Courtney Walsh. A nice juicy full toss just on the pads. Just using the pace of the ball to just guide it through the spaces. Might just have jumped himself into trouble there. Probably they're going to be jumping for a while. There's a ray of something bright. Which one is the real one? Beautifully bold. Well, he almost got him. Just seemed to leave the batsman off the pitch and then went a long way after it got past the bat. He's passed him on either side of the bat now, one with a very good leg cutter, and the other one, which looked from here as though it came back between bat and pad. No, nope, still on the outside, but very game leave there. Advantage of uh, the one pitched round about his pads. The end of uh, Bishop's over. Neatly played away by Gallen. Three more runs added to take England along to 39 for no wicket at the close of the fourth day of this Cornhill Test match. Galleon 22, Atherton 17. Galleon did well. It's no easy task to go out there when you're on a pair and bat with the comfort he did. Atherton was there at the end, as he has been all along for England this series, and 39 on the board for England. Now, the bowling figures, no wickets taken there. Chander Paul and Hooper bowled. Hooper, the off spinner. Chander Paul, the leg spinner, bowled for the first time in the series. Four overs, no maiden, and no wicket for five. And the reason they were brought on was that Richie Richardson realised the umpires would offer the light to the batsman if the quick bowler stayed on. He whipped his spinners on very quickly. One of the strange sights I've ever seen in uh, Test match cricket, or any other cricket for that matter, is that before Chander Paul started to bowl, he put on a pair of shin pads, which uh, could have all sorts of meanings, I suppose. He may have had an experience with the batsman driving back at him very, very fast. Four overs for five for him. And uh, the state of the match at the conclusion of this fourth day, England having got through to 39 for no wicket, are 199 runs behind. Uh, it's a very good match, has been all the way through, as indeed has been the series. And here's Geoffrey Boycott now with his ideas on the day. Well, another terrific day's cricket with the West Indies batsman on top. It was the big stand between Hooper and Chanderpaul that put the England bowlers to the sword. Hooper, calm, elegant, classical. Chanderpaul, a young man making, making his way, doesn't look quite as uh, classical as Hooper, but a very effective young man that should have a great test career. The England bowlers, they stuck at it hard. It was the ground feeling that impressed me. Two hard days in the field, they stuck at it very well, the England fielders. But it, if they'd have caught the catchers, they could have saved themselves a lot of grief. Chander Paul and Hooper were both dropped early on. 
one was difficult, one was straightforward. Tomorrow, what will happen? Well, everybody says it'll be a draw. But if West Indies get early wickets, England know they could slide to defeat. I fancy a draw, though. The pitch has taken the sting out of all the bowlers, and the pitch has won in the end. But you never can tell with these West Indies fast bowlers. Thanks, Geoffrey. Geoffrey Boycott with his ideas on what has happened throughout the four days of this match and what might happen on the fifth day. We'll be there with BBC One and uh, today. Well, it won't be quite as flamboyant because England have no chance of winning. What they have to do is get through for a draw. And this is the way they start off at the beginning of the final day. 39 for no wicket, the two men in occupation. Jason Galleon on 22. Michael Atherton on 17, no extra so far. And the bowlers used... Walsh, Ambrose, Hooper, Chanderpaul and Bishop. None for 22 for Walsh. They used the spinners yesterday evening because the light was bad and Richardson wanted to stay on. And the state of the game, 199 runs behind. That's a long way, so England will have to work very, very hard today. With his ideas on uh, the way the pitch might play, here's Geoffrey Boycott. Fifth day on this pitch, and look at it. It's as dry as it ever was. Two innings have been played in four days, and I reckon they could play a test match for another four days on this. All you've got are the red marks of the ball. We're walking down. You can't see anything hardly. And I just feel that, quite frankly, it's too good for a test match. West Indies will have all on this morning to get early wickets. It's their only chance of winning the game. But if England survive the first hour and a half, I think then they'll just bat nicely through the day, and West Indies will give up about tea time. It is flat, flat and flatter still. One of the flattest I've ever seen at the Oval. For my money, it's too good for a test match. Well, there you go then, and uh, that'll be good news for Michael Atherton, Jason Gallian, and the other England batsmen. Well, Kenny Benjamin was an absentee from that bowling list for the West Indies yesterday, and he didn't take the field on the final day. They said from the dressing room it's unlikely he'll take any further part in the match. He has a severe back problem. We join it now with the first ball. The second over is being bowled. Ambrose is the man with the ball in hand, and Atherton is taking strike. Outside edge, sort of run off the base, no third man, attacking fields. Just relax the hands here, and it just drifted off the outside edge of the face. Runs raced away. Played that very well. The youngster played well there. If you watch him carefully, he really looked at the ball. It snaked back at him. It's a good short delivery. He's one of the two allowed for the over. But he really kept his eye on the ball. That's well played, lad. Nicely timed by Mike Atherton. Keith Atherton, very quick over the ground, but not quick enough. That shot's been a feature of Mike Atherton's series. The way he bats, very strong in that particular area, just short outside the off stump. Even if, even if this hasn't been the quickest oval pitch we've ever seen, the ball's still carrying through. Courtney Brown, the keeper, has been taking several this morning at chest height. Yeah, the thing is there, but if you see second slip, the guy here, he should really be level with the keeper, and he's behind the keeper. I mean, the best second slipper I've ever seen, Ian Bolton, was sometimes in front of the keeper. I wouldn't advise that for too many catches. He should be somewhere here. He should be up here. This guy... I think he's too deep. That's very well bowled. <laughs> and not all that gracefully accepted either. <laughs> well, the reason for that is that he, he's had a third slip most of the time. But uh, they moved him around to leg gully that third slip, and this one gets up into the throat, plays it down as best he can, and it went, well, wideish of third slip, but th because it looped, third slip would have had a chance of diving for it. Oh. 
Got him. The swell bowled, and Ambrose has done well this morning. He's been steaming in there and working on the batsman of roundabout off stump. And the bounce was there that time. There is still bounce in this pitch. Bowlers need to bend their backs, and that's just what he did. This is a quick ball. If you look at the man at Sir Steve catching this, it hit him as he was coming down for the catch. Just fast, just a little bit of outswing, leg cut perhaps, top edge, and Williams took a very sharp catch. Perhaps this is the kind of bowling that is going to be special. Ambrose got five wickets in the first innings, and a good start, I think, for him this morning. Michael Atherton, eighth. He's had a good summer against West Indies. Played with great skill and courage. He's come from 10th to 8th. That's in the world rankings. And the White Mackays, he's uh, number 11. Just short. Oh, Courtney Brown, I wonder. I wonder if the replay will show that he might have had a dash at that. And the first innings, he did a few of these. And perhaps this one he didn't decide to go at. Dropped just about foot and a half, two feet in front of Carl Hooper. Oh, beautifully bold. And you must say that Curtly Ambrose has deserved that wicket. His line has been good. He's bowled with great aggression really has given it everything this morning. John Crawley is the victim, caught by Brown, Bowl Ambrose for two, 64 for two now. This is a very good ball. They actually see the sea moving and genuine edge. around the over ground now for the local man, Graham Thorpe. Well, the first step this morning for West Indies was to persuade the fast bowlers that they could win the game. The next step is to persuade the England dressing room that the West Indies can win this game. And that's when uh, you have a game on your hands. Oh, that's well bowled. But this is some of the best bowling we've seen. And remember that Kirtley Ambrose got five wickets in the first innings. This is a different ball. This one goes away from the left-hander. Well, the shot went catch, but the ball went down. A fuller length from Ian Bishop. Uh, not as much bounce as Ambrose has been having. Or played it well in the end. Oh. I think he has to ask himself, is this what England really requires of him at the moment? And the answer is most certainly no. Colin Croft has gone off to a quiet corner to contemplate West Indies victory, which he predicts during the day. And next to me is perched the realism of Mr. Boycott. Well, if England lose this test match on this pitch, there'll be a lot of questions they'll be asking themselves and the selectors will be asking the players. as the footwork fails, but I'm sure Richardson got it right, but it wasn't uh, very well bowled by Bishop. It was pulled down and across, and it's nicely played, and Mike Aston always times the ball well. 
in that situation. That's an even better shot from Graham Thorpe. Perfectly placed, straight down the ground. Beautiful example of how just timing and balance are all that's needed to send the ball to the boundary. Well, Graham Thorpe will have four for that. Not as authentic as the previous boundary. All counts the same, though. Riveting stuff. Been some complaints of lack of Caribbean atmosphere about this match. Certainly, they're quieter games than they used to be. But there may be something to shout about later on. Thank you very much. All runs greatly accepted this morning. And that boundary also bringing up the 100 for England. Now 101 for two. And Chanderpaul again, too short. Doesn't matter what the situation of the match is or what England's primary objectives are. Chanderpaul is going to bowl that short. Graham Thorpe is going to continue plundering runs. That's well bowled. Every now and again, Walsh and Ambrose just get a bit of life out of this pitch, enough to surprise the batsman. As well played by Mike Atherton. Gotcha. Hasn't quite got hold of that as well as Graham Thorpe did in the previous over. But it's enough to take Mike Atherton to 50. 52 not out now. Very patient, very well played innings. That's his 25th score of 50 or above, not including the 800s he's also made in his 51 test matches. Ball toss and uh, four more gift runs. Chanderpaul unable to decide whether long hops or full tosses are the order of the day. Atherton and Thorpe very happy to decide that runs must be taken. One of the great things about Thorpe, he takes full advantage of anything loose. Cooper's had him tied down this over, and all of a sudden that one is just a little bit shorter. It was the top spinner. It's just got on to the rough stuff there and turned a little bit so when he cuts his fingers under and uh, thought crashed it away there's no shortage of uh, field placement uh, changes out there Master! once again the quicker ball and the drifts with the arm fingers under the ball Big buys. Carl Hooper was hoping Pride might have been salvaged by having it said to be runs, but you, that drifted a long way. Well played here by Thorpe, just getting his fingers off of it and just dropping in front of the man at Gurley. But Courtney Walsh's reaction again was very interesting. Just thinking he had gotten another wicket and a breakthrough. Oh, well taken. What a good catch. Courtney Walsh has his reward for perseverance. It's the wicket of Graham Thorpe, caught by Stuart Williams, for 38. Well, Stuart Williams gets better as this tour gets to the end. A good ball, short, bounced, 
A really magnificent diving catch to his left. He's naturally right-handed. Walsh is very pleased because Graham Thorpe has been a thorn in the West Indies side all this summer, and especially now, excellent wicket to get. We're in England's third wicket falling, so Graham Hick on his way out. So England now 132 for three. Graham Hicks still working on improving those test match career figures. But he's batted very well in these last two test matches of the series. 100 at Trent Bridge, 96 in the first innings here. That was close. Good place for Courtney Walsh to aim his opening delivery at Graham Hick. Pass intended Yorker. Just an inside edge. That's going to lob over the slips. And uh, the attempted flick back by Carl Hooper. Slightly mistimed, so Graham Hick gets four runs for it, but he had absolutely no control over the shot. Courtney Walsh is still down, disappointed. The bunks. Somewhat fortunate here for Graham Hick. I suspect that Courtney Walsh would far rather bowl at Graham Hick than at Mike Atherton. This is wonderful fast bowling on a flat pitch. Courtney Walsh's line in these few balls he's had at Graham Hick has been absolutely immaculate. No escaping for Graham Hick, just jabbing down on top of that one in time. Nicely timed. Yes, it was a very good shot because it was outside off stump, very full delivery, and he worked it to the onside. Another great example from Mike Allerton of what he can achieve with timing. Nothing more than a firm push from the England captain. Full face of the bat. That's one of the shortest boundaries on this otherwise big field. Ian Bishop had no chance of getting around in time. West Indies could get uh, both these two out by tea time. Yeah. Looks as if Kirtley's going to give him a little bit of a going over. Then West Indies would feel they're into Alan Wells and the tail enders. It's a lovely moment there. And the lovely moment wasn't exactly Graham Hicks shot at the back foot. That's a good enough shot. Four runs. Fine shot. Just in that slot which the batsman really loves, especially Michael Atherton, who plays those so beautifully off the pads. And rocketed away for four runs. Takes Mike Athlon now to 82, 167 to three. This is Courtney Walsh. Well, there's a man out there. But he's not in quite the right spot. I hazard a guess there that uh, Graham Hick read the body language right that Courtney Walsh wouldn't be very pleased and the ball might be short. Good shot again. 
with that discoloured, soft, out of shape ball. <laughs> Graham Hick has played two blinding strokes. Over pitched, a gift. Just leaning into it and driving. With your eyes off of that, that's four. I think uh, that's a nasty blow. Seemed to me it got him perhaps on the elbow. I think he's in trouble there. Right on the point of the elbow. Just up above that arm guard. Ooh, dear. Well, he's mustering uh, half a smile. That's something, but uh, I didn't like the look uh, <laughs> of the way he was uh, staggering away from the crease. Magic spray fixes anything. The difference between that and the other strokes where he gets himself into trouble is that that was a pull. He plays that well, it's the hook shot that gets him into all sorts of bother. I think Carl Hooper is somewhat convinced that he did hit this. I would show that it's very far away from the bat. Pad, upper part of the body, and short leg. Well, it uh, could have missed the bat by more, but not by much more. Once again, the shortest boundary on the ground. Very hard to protect when the bowlers stray in line like that. Applause ringing around the ground from those 6,000 spectators for the England 200. This should be worth four and is. Every four runs like this, just edging England closer to that position where West Indies would have to bat again if for some reason seven wickets were to go down reasonably quickly now. It's not looking very likely. Fielded. Not sure what the uh, hold up was there. There was one in it and it was going away to uh, Atherton's wrong hand. There's definitely one there, but Atherton has hesitated. And 
and uh, then had to come through very quickly. Gone for 95. And it's that leg glance again. Just turning the ball away down the leg side, never getting himself in line with it. It's happened to him a number of times. We were pinpointing it earlier in the day. And we were saying that there should be a leg slip in there as well. Courtney Brown has taken a great catch. 95 for Atherton once again. Ian Bishop went wide of the crease, slanted it in, and a very neat catch. No doubt about it. And he's let in through that dismissal, Alan Wells on a pair. And Ian Bishop and uh, Alan Wells. sense of humour, he appreciates the applause for uh, having missed a king pair, even though uh, he hasn't yet laid bat on ball in the innings. Off the mark, and that'll be a great relief for Alan Wells. But Lee looks like suffering a little bit, certainly with a limp. I think he's saying goodbye. goodbye. And he must reckon it's um, just about over. He reckons uh, his hamstring is gone. And uh, he's done a great job in this match. Gone really well in the first innings. And he just gave West Indies a bit of a glimmer today great cheer goes up Graham Hick acknowledges applause for his 50 and it's an interesting point that he's now scored 400 runs in the series the first time in his test career That's the pleasing sound of bat on ball, which Alan Wells needs to hear. Ah, David Shepherd, superstition abounds here, where you, when you're on 111 or 222 or 333, you're not supposed to have both feet on the ground at the same time. So England's still behind, 222 for four, 51 to Hick, and there goes. Hop along, Shepherd. <laughs> Extra bunks of the new ball. He just deceiving Alan Wells. Missed by a whisker. So there's two fine deliveries. Now, umpire Shepherd will uh, just test Courtney Walsh's sense of humour by pointing out to him that he's very close to bowling a no ball. Just one more run added to take the final score for England in their second innings along to 223 for four. There was nothing uh, by way of profit there for Alan Wells. The good thing was that he wasn't dismissed. He made just three. Graham Hick played very well again after a rather scratchy start, 51. That's a very good all-round uh, double for him. 90-odd in the first innings and 51 not out in the second. 
and Thorpe 38, but well again, Atherton 95, very unlucky once again to fall short of the three figures. 223 for four for England. The bowling figures, well, the West Indies struggled. They had players seemingly off the field uh, every 10 minutes of the innings. But they finished up uh, cracking four wickets, one for Walsh, two for Ambrose. And I thought Ambrose was magnificent in this match. He really lifted himself. He was just a little bit weary earlier in the uh, tour, but he did wonderfully well in the first innings, then 19 overs, eight maidens, and two for 35 in the second. Bishop, 22 overs, four maidens, one for 56. Never really looked happy out there. Didn't have his run right, his action. Never seemed to be happy with that and uh, had plenty of problem areas there, Ian Bishop. And the match itself, well, England 454, 223 for four in their second innings. West Indies 692 for eight. Everyone will remember that wonderful knock from Brian Lara for 179, long after they recall that the match was drawn. Series drawn to all. It's been a wonderful series all the way through. And uh, at the presentations, the man of the match was named as Brian Lara. The England player of the series, chosen by the West Indies management, Michael Atherton, who had a terrific time as skipper and as opening batsman. And the West Indies player of the series, chosen by the chairman of the England selection committee, Raymond Illingworth, was Brian Lara. And uh, a little later, David Gower talked with the two captains and with the man of the match. Michael, congratulations on another fighting performance today and on your Player of the Series award. It was a pretty tough battle again, wasn't it, just to finish off this series? Yeah, we were up against it on the last day. The West Indies came in hard this morning, uh, obviously fancied their chances, but I was pleased with the way we kind of stuck it out. Now, you yourself have had a, a good series again, finishing off on this note. How much does it mean to you to be nominated Player of the Series, as well as having to do all the other jobs, batting, captaining, seeing the lads through it? I was quite surprised, really. It was very nice what Wes Hall said in his uh, statement. Maybe Dominic Cork and Graham Thorpe maybe feel a little bit aggrieved, but, you know, the personal awards don't mean that much. It's the way the team plays, and um, I was pleased that we put in a, a fighting performance all summer. I was a bit disappointed that we couldn't get the upper hand in the last two games, but, you know, the West Indies are still a good side. Well, thanks very much. Congratulations on your own efforts and the team's efforts through the summer. Richie, a long tour. It's all but done. You've still got a couple of lesser games to play. How satisfied are you with your team's performance? Well, I m must say that um, I'm a little bit disappointed. Uh, I believe that we've got a team that's capable of winning this series. Um, we started out very well, um, but uh, we didn't really bat as well as we probably could have. Um, but in the end, I think um, I'm not all that disappointed. So you're disappointed then that you actually gave those two test matches away, are you? Is that, is that the impression? Well, I don't really like the term, um, you know, giving matches away because um, we don't really do that you know we go there and we try our best sometimes our best is not good enough and uh, there are times uh, that we didn't play to our full potential and i think if we had played a bit better we would have won comfortably now these two pitches in the last two matches they were enough to deaden your pace attack how have the boys stood up to that well the thing is all fast bowlers can bowl anything i've said it a number of times before and you know in the last test match in uh, at, uh, trent bridge it was flat it was docile and um, our bowlers bowl very very well you know and i uh, hear it was flat as well and it's still I still bowl pretty well and um, the thing is uh, if there is anything at all in the wicket or fast bowlers are going to make the rest of it. Uh, Brian Lara now he's a man that uh, rather came good in these last three test matches of the series how highly do you rate him now he must be very close to being the best in the world. Well undoubtedly he has to be the best in the world he is the best in the world I mean it's I'm delighted to be uh, you know to be playing with him to be, to be his captain I mean whenever I'm out there with him whenever I watch him back down it's just a delight. This Brian Lara as well, man of the match, player of the series, you name it, virtually everything. It's been a very satisfying series for you again. Yeah, it's been, it's been good to come good in the last three test matches. Um, you know, I'd love to trade one of these centuries for a second in Sandra at Lords, but um, yeah, that's how it worked out. I thought it was a very good series. Both teams played pretty well, a bit inconsistent at the time, and um, ended in a draw. And, you know, same as 1991, but I'm, I'm happy. You say you'd like to trade it for a, for a, a hundred at Lords. I dare say there'll be another chance. <laughs> Yeah, well, of course there'll be another chance to play at Lords, but um, I mean, 100 there might have meant a victory in a second test match and maybe a different story in the series. But um, you know, I'm still quite happy at ending the series with over 700 runs and uh, playing a very important part in our team's success. Yes, he is a wonderful young cricketer and uh, we've got many more test match runs to watch from him and I can tell you it'll be exhilarating to be at the ground or watching on television at the time. And here now with his uh, ideas on the match is Geoffrey Boycott. For me, the result was never in doubt. A disappointing draw. 
The West Indies fast bowlers had a go early on, got a couple of early wickets. But all in all, the batsmen didn't have too much trouble. I thought Michael Atherton played splendidly. Calm, unruffled, and it was disappointing, really, that he didn't get a century. He fully deserved one. Hick played very well, so did Thorpe, but all in all, the pitch won. We came to the Oval, four results in this test series, two evenly matched teams, everybody was looking for a winner. And what we got was a draw. The pitch was so good that batsmen could have batted here for another four or five days and we wouldn't be sure then that we'd get a result. If the Surrey County Cricket Club are going to make batting pitches that don't seem and are unresponsive to spin, then they're going to have to give the bowlers something. And that means a lot more pace and bounce. If they don't, what we'll find at the Oval on pitches like this is that we will need timeless tests and nobody wants to go back to those. Thanks, Geoffrey. Geoffrey Boycott with uh, his thoughts on this test series. And I agree with him. It was a very, very fine series of cricket. Six Cornhill test matches and uh, every one of them had something. And there were four victories in that six. Well, that's the end of the test cricket for this summer. But we do have cricket coming up on Saturday. It's the NatWest final. NatWest trophy final at Lord's Northamptonshire against Warwickshire. It'll be in grandstand on the 2nd of September, BBC One at 10.20 a.m. And I can assure you it's with some sadness that I say now goodbye to Test Cricket.